I mean, thank you, Alan and Rob, for chairing the session. Um, give me a second. Um, just a quick conflict of interest slide, please. Um, I'm going to just review very briefly on a slide the evidence of ER positive breast cancer being a chronic disease. And I've chosen the postmenopausal curve that Nancy showed a few minutes ago. She showed both curves, and I've just chosen to focus on the postmenopausal curve. A number of things can be observed from these control and tamoxifen curves. If you look on the right, the right panel, you can see that in the first five years, there's the steepest recurrence period in the control group, as well as in the tamoxifen treated group, and you can see the powerful effect of tamoxifen and the benefits that Nancy discussed in those first five years. In the second five years, five through 10 years, you can see that the curves still part between controls and treatment, and showing that there's a residual hangover, the so-called carryover effect of tamoxifen. And then the curves become somewhat straight, and that's borne out by data I'll show later on, that there's really not much carryover effect beyond 10 years in patients treated with adjuvant tamoxifen. Now we know from treating patients that a number of factors feed into the chances of recurrence the age of the patient, the menopausal status, the TNM stage, the degree of ER, PR positivity in particular, whether the PR is positive or not and how high the ER is, the grade and with it the key 67 and HER2 status. And together you see that's the IHC4 and I point that out because I'll say something about the data in that. And tumor gene signatures, we have a number of them to try to predict recurrence in ER positive breast cancer. And Nancy said something about this oncotype, mammoprint, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the Mass General Hospital Breast Cancer Index, which was presented at San Antonio by my colleague Dennis Segroy, and then other signatures that have been heard about in this meeting, evolving signatures. Now, the problem with looking at that postmenopausal curve is that the first five years of treatment, as everybody knows, have been largely replaced, um, at least in high-income populations, by aromatase inhibitors. And indeed, the Oxford Overview meta-analysis of the first five years of adjuvant endocrine therapy in postmenopausal women, be it straight five years of any of the three AIs, or be it a switch of the first tamoxifen to an AI, shows statistically significant benefit, which is superior to tamoxifen, as shown in the red. Um, the AIs cause a significantly lower recurrence rate versus tamoxifen. And in the big 198, there was an IPCW analysis for mortality which adjusts for the crossover that was occurred in these trials once the patients found out the superior arm. And there was a survival advantage demonstrated in Big 198 and published about that. And importantly, Jim is going to talk about toxicities, but there were no increases in non-breast cancer deaths from, for the AIs in the meta-analysis of the Oxford. Now, I'm going to focus specifically on efficacy and not toxicity because it's a talker in its own right. And Jim will talk about toxicities in postmenopausal, and Nancy covered some of it for premenopausal. So let me just focus on the efficacy. Here is the design of MA17, and I'll say at the outset that there were 5,000 and something patients enrolled, and they were enrolled at the point of randomization. Um, they had been diagnosed for four to six years before, and importantly, as Nancy pointed out, and I'll say it, some of those patients were premenopausal at original diagnosis. All were postmenopausal at the point of randomization, so the pre's had become postmenopausal. And just to say, before, in case I forget, we had five patients in 5,200 resume any form of vaginal bleeding in both arms of the trial. And um, so the criteria published for selecting a patient who's been on adjuvant tamoxifen, whether she's postmenopausal or not, without any biochemical testing, are f pretty reliable if one uses the criteria from MA17 of how we chose patients who had previously been premenopausal. And you can see MA17 during the five years of the letrozole treatment showed very significant improvement as we published previously in disease-free, distant disease-free. Overall survival was not significant, but you'll recall that we presented this at a very early time point, the first interim analysis. But in the pre-specified node positive uh, analysis, indeed overall survival, in the node positive patients, overall survival was positive and contralateral new primary was powerfully positive as well. A subsequent longer outcome, longer term outcome analysis by Dongsheng to the statistician from NCIC and his colleagues with an IPCW analysis of MA17 showed that indeed overall survival was positive for all patients in the trial. And in fact, we published a separate paper showing that those patients with ERPR positive, about 3,500, had a significant overall survival rate. Those with ER positive, PR negative did not. 
Here is a meta-analysis, which I'm ashamed to say has not yet been published, and it's my bad, but a meta-analysis of the four trials that we could put together of extended AI therapy after tamoxifen, five years of tamoxifen, and the meta-analysis shows a strong positive benefit driven primarily by, by MA17 and in part by NSABP B33, and you can see that going on to five years of an AI after tamoxifen is superior to just tamoxifen alone. I'm going to say a few words about ATLAS, and I won't contradict anything Nancy said, and I just want to put my own perspective on it. Prior to ATLAS, the NSABP B14 in the Scottish trial had been negative for extending tamoxifen, but it could be argued that both were underpowered. The ATOM trial, which is an important trial, is still ongoing and hasn't presented enough data to render a verdict yet on prolonged tamoxifen. So really, ATLAS is the first and most significant study to show that extending tamoxifen is beneficial over just five years. Um, here is the randomization or, or, the, or the allocation of, on ATLAS. And you can see, as Nancy pointed out, only 9.1% of the patients were premenopausal in the entire study out of 6,846 ER positive patients. All the others were postmenopausal. So it's predominantly a study of postmenopausal re randomization of tamoxifen to further five years. And in this trial presented by the ATLAS investigators, they said that recurrence and breast cancer mortality, there was little effect, and this is important, during the five to nine years uh, of treatment, and the benefit was mainly after 10 years. And you can see that on the slide. Just look at the first column. The first column says five years of tamoxifen versus nothing, and you can see the carryover benefit of the first five years of tamoxifen in the hazard ratios in that first column, and in mortality both for recurrence and mortality. And then you look at ATLAS, which is 10 versus that five, and you see no difference in the first five years, obviously. In the second five years, during the tamoxifen extension period, there's no significance to the use of treatment for those five years, unlike in MA17, which I just showed. And in years 10 to, in years 10 to 15, or after years 10, you see a significance in disease-free survival and in overall survival in this trial, both of them positive. And then the investigators compared the 10-year data to the control group from previous uh, Oxford overviews of no treatment, and you can see a significant benefit to tamoxifen all the way through beyond 10 years versus no treatment. So the current options in the extended setting for postmenopausal women after five years of tamoxifen, switching to an AI seems superior to continuing tamoxifen. However, in high income populations, most patients do not come off five years of tamoxifen. However, there are many middle income and low income countries in whom tamoxifen is still the standard of care for all insulin receptor positive patients, including postmenopausal patients. And in those patients, perhaps the strategy these strategies are still significant. Now, what about current options in the extended setting for premenopausal women? Well, to start with, Nancy just reviewed, in year zero to five, tamoxifen as monotherapy remains the current standard of care, and the soft and text results are awaited. So that first five years is about to possibly change in terms of the standard of care. But what about year five to 10? Those who are still premenopausal, and, have, and I'm going to divide my presentation into those who are still premenopausal and those who've become postmenopausal, either by virtue of age while they've been taking tamoxifen, or due to prior chemotherapy, which often induces menopause. So, um, premenopausal after five years of tamoxifen. So. I'm talking about this subset of patients who've taken their five years of, pre of pre premenopausal tamoxifen and are still having regular menses, and we all see these patients in the clinic. What are the options in those patients? And I think that what Nancy showed is important, that the ATLAS trial, although it shows benefit to extending tamoxifen further, only less than 10% of the patients were premenopausal. The forest plot in, their, in, in, in support of their results, though, the forest plot was not significant in the premenopausal subset of patients, but it was a small subset. And the direction of the forest plot is in the same direction as the overall study results. And the p-value for interaction between pre and post is not significant, meaning that the, 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 the result, this is a subset of a result that's positive and therefore should be considered positive, although these are the forest plot data. So considering to, continuing tamoxifen in premenopausal after five years, is an option based on the ATLAS trial in those women who are premenopausal after five years. Now, the, the data that Nancy alluded to, and I'll just quickly show it, is what about patients who are premenopausal? And I would actually argue, I haven't done the numbers, but I think most patients in numerical numbers 
are postmenopausal at the conclusion of five years of tamoxifen, even if they were premenopausal at the outset. And that was what we focused on in MA17. How did those patients do if they were postmenopausal when we randomized them to letrozole or placebo? And this is just one little um, piece of the figures that we published in Annals of Oncology just recently. But you can see a highly substantial benefit for switching to letrozole if the patient began premenopausal, was postmenopausal by the MA17 criteria at the end of five years, and was randomized. There was a very substantial benefit to taking extended letrozole. There are other ongoing trials of extended adjuvant endocrine therapy with aromatase inhibitors, and I'd show some of them here. These are, these are studies, not all of them, but studies of going with an AI for five years, and then what about after that? From the animal date of Angela Brody, resistance to letrozole takes almost twice as long as to tamoxifen. So I'm optimistic that longer than five years of letrozole is going to continue to afford patients benefits, unlike with tamoxifen. Uh, or at least unlike what we believe. And, and the metastatic data really uh, sub support that. If you look at untreated stage four breast cancer patients treated with either letrozole or tamoxifen, median time to progression about nine months for letrozole, about six months for tamoxifen, about a, a one third increase in the time to progression. So MA17R should be coming fairly soon. We re-randomized MA17 patients as well as patients up front to a further letrozole placebo and MA17 type randomization. And NSABP B42, slightly different question, because our trial is, is more than five years of AI good, no matter where, how you took the AI. NSABP B42 is really asking, is a 10-year endocrine therapy better than a five, if the first five included an AI in some form or another? Now, I just want to say a bit about biomarker signatures for extended therapies specifically, because the risk-benefit, as people have alluded to, is really important. Are you going to commit so many patients to treatment initially? And here are the signatures that I mentioned at the beginning. The breast cancer index is evolved at Mass General, and it's divided into two components, a two-gene signature of HOXB13 over IL-17, just a two-gene signature, and then a five-gene molecular grade index signature, which is really a, a reflection of proliferation. It's a proliferation component. All these signatures contain proliferation as a major component, key 67 for IHC4 and the other two signatures. And lo and behold, if you look at these signatures, and this is, a, this is data that was presented by uh, Dennis Segroy at uh, San Antonio, but um, in, in, I'm, I'm, I'm representing the same slides on behalf of Jack Kuzik and Mitch Darset, who were intimately involved in transit attack, and all the other investigators in that study. And from a prognostic performance point of view, all the signatures worked well in predicting a recurrence in the first five years. But after that, and this is a head-to-head -head comparison of the signatures, the breast cancer index remained statistically highly significant, and the other two uh, signatures did not produce significance in the extended adjuvant setting. So it seems like BCI is a predictor of recurrence in the lay. Now, if one looks at differences between BCI low and BCI intermediate or high, you can see that this is year, look at the x-axis marked from five to 10 years. Um, you can see that even during this time, there's an intermediate and high risk group that have a 13.4% risk of recurrence compared to a low group, which is 60%, who have a very low risk, 3.5% over those five years. So this signature splits the patients into those at risk and those not. And I would argue that those at risk either go on standard therapy or go on investigational therapy, and those at low risk be considered on a case-by-case -case basis for omission of further therapy, perhaps. We looked at this signature in terms of its predictive ability, and in MA17, we found on a case control study that H over I, and now this is in the second five years, BCI has a pro ability to predict in the first five years because of its proliferative molecular grade index component. But H over I has no grade component. It's two miraculous genes that predict for an estrogen receptor positive estrogen driven disease recurrence that is not proliferation driven. And this signature, this component, had a very significant predictive ability to predict for benefit to letrozole. And that was different from other signatures, which are mainly prognostic. And again, in the transatax study, now this is not extended therapy, but if we looked at the 
the, three, the signatures at baseline and looked at the ability to predict for late recurrence in follow-up of, of the ATAC trial, we found that if you had a high H over I, there was a strong ability of the signature to predict favorably for anastrozole over tamoxifen. So it was treatment predictive versus the low score, which didn't predict for any difference in outcome between tamoxifen and anastrozole. So there's substantial risk of ongoing disease in ER positive, beyond five years in ER positive patients. Endocrine therapy for five years does not eliminate that risk. The options, therefore, beyond five years in postmenopausal women um, or pre, who have become post, including switching to, a, to, to an aromatase inhibitor, which affords immediate and ongoing benefit and survival advantage over the next five years, which the ATLAS trial does not. But extending to moxifen is an interesting alternative option posed by the data from the ATLAS trial. In women remaining premenopausal after initial tamoxifen, extending to moxifen might be an option or a new therapy such as of ovarian function suppression or some other way. But using the gene signatures is probably important to make that decision. Gene signatures of the primary tumor may provide information on subgroups at risk, prediction of therapeutic benefit, which is important, the time dependence of when a patient might recur early versus late, and that's important to women in the clinic, and therefore models like Adjuvant Online, which many of us use a lot, that will evolve, I believe, to include in addition to patient characteristics like age, comorbidities, and tumor factors, like cl clinical pathologic features, et cetera, should begin to integrate promising gene signatures to help patients and physicians make treatment decisions. Individual risks for treatment toxicity should be included on Adjuvant Online. I'd just like to thank some people, the trans tech uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Catherine Strass, who's in the audience and helped me with the manuscript and with the presentation, and some of my other colleagues, collaborators from the North American Breast Group with MA17 and from BIG, and patients, all the patients that participated in all these trials. Thank you very much.